for everyone who's a member here, sincere thanks. We really appreciate the support. We'd love to have you all as members, but if that's not right for you, that's fine. If uh, you're a first time guest here, welcome. I hope it's not your only time, please come back. Um, if you could make a $5 donation, we'd greatly appreciate it. Every little bit helps, but uh, thanks for coming. And I, I hope you become regulars. If, if there are certain topics that any of you think we really should have that we've been neglecting, don't hesitate to let me know that we'll work on whatever kind of programming people really want and uh, do our best to keep everybody educated and entertained. So, some other free programs related to the Chicago Maritime Museum is the Underwater Archaeological Society of Chicago. On the third or on the last Wednesday of each month, we have programs. Uh, this month, we're featuring Dr. Ben Ford talking about the archaeology of maritime cultural landscapes. So if you're interested in maritime archaeology or just want to learn more about maritime history, uh, please check out the Underwater Archaeological Society, and I'm sure you'll find that program uh, really enlightening. Well, tonight we're very pleased to have with us Joel Stone. Joel's best known, he's, I'm sorry, he's one of the best known and most important and well-liked figures in the Great Lakes maritime history community. <laughs> he, he's the curator emeritus of the Detroit Historical Society, which includes the Detroit Historical Museum and the Dawson Great Lakes Maritime Museum. He's also the past president of the Association for Great Lakes Maritime History. I mean, with that, he was really the face of the Great Lakes maritime history community and he did a fabulous job of it. He's the author of Floating Palaces of the Great Lakes, A History of the Passenger Steamers on the Inland Seas. And for us museum nerds, he edited and contributed to the book, Interpreting Maritime History at, Mer at Museums and Historical Sites. Joel, we really appreciate those books. They're great resources. So we're thrilled to have you here. So please everybody join me in welcoming Joel Stone. It's, it's nice to be talking to folks in Chicago. I, I'm so used to doing this presentation. Um, you know, in, in my region, and it's nice to be able to have the opportunity to take it beyond that. Um, I think the next step is for me to get the presentation up and running, so you're not looking at me. There we go. So again, I, this presentation is, is Great Lakes centric, um, and I have to say because of my, uh, my uh, heart here in Detroit and the uh, the history here in Detroit and the fact that I give this presentation mostly in Detroit, it's going to have a little bit more Detroit history than maybe Chicago history, which doesn't mean that I uh, am, am dissing the Chicago area we're going to cover. Actually, there's a great slide that I discussed for a bit that really talks about Detroit and Chicago and, and the boats. Um, I got really lucky with this project in that University of Michigan came to me. Um, I'm sure many of you have, uh, you know, developed written books. We've just been talking about that. And what you're going to find is it's, it's, it's difficult to write a book. It's even more difficult to get it published. And when the University of Michigan came to me and suggested that they would like a book on this topic, um, first, I suggested a couple of other authors, and they pushed on with me and, and were willing to uh, let me do this, and I had a great time with it. This, um, my, my background on the Great Lakes um, covers many things. I started, you know, being involved with the schooner angle, but there were a lot of people doing that. Uh, the, the steamships, the passenger boats was something that has always intrigued me, particularly with the collection that we had at the Dawson Great Lakes Museum. Being able to get the story out there was, it was a wonderful opportunity. Unfortunately, it happened right at the time when we were busy rebuilding both of our museums and I was busy writing five or six different exhibits. These things never happen easily. So it all came together. I think it came together well. It's nice to be able to talk about this with folks. It, this presentation was also developed kind of for a maybe a less well-tuned audience that I have right here. This is a group of people who really understand the Great Lakes, understand the ships, understand the nature of the lakes. And I will gloss over some of the slides just because they're meant more for an explanation standpoint. But, you know, we're basically talking about the big boats. We're talking about the, the gorgeous vessels that used to cruise the Great Lakes and carry folks all over the place. This is a picture of Detroit in 1967, where the Robin Hood flower towers stand then. 
is now our Renaissance Center. So if you're familiar with our skyline, this is you know our big our biggest skyscraper. But it used to be the place where all the vessels came, starting with the walk in the water, showed up almost at this exact spot back in 1817, or rather 1818. But the history started in 1817 on Lake Ontario. Walk in the water arrived here in 1818, and this same spot allowed people to travel on beautiful ships right up until this point, this spot in October 22nd. 1967, when the South American finally pulled away for the last time, heading for Montreal, Expo 67 Montreal. And curiously, this is almost a a perfect 150-year window, which from a historian's standpoint, to be able to bookmark steamship travel for passenger folks that easily, that closely in Detroit was wonderful. It wasn't wasn't much different in Chicago. Of course, uh, Buffalo, kind of the other lakehead, Duluth, and important here. But there were so many various routes that were traveled by these big boats. And those of you who have studied that the passenger ships or, or simply boats that carried passengers, which could have been schooners, which could have been packets, which were tugboats. I mean, there were all kinds of vessels carrying passengers. I basically concentrated on what are generally known as the palace steamers. And the literature tends to keep the palace steamer era pre-American Civil War. So there's kind of an antebellum nature to it. But I think in my book, I proved that there really was a second palace steamer era when the vessels reemerged as these, these massive, elegant, beautiful steamers. I mean, and they were, they were in Detroit, they were mostly side wheelers. There were a number of propellers and we will, we'll, we'll talk about that. You know, really in the Great Lakes, well, there's wonderful histories done about what happened on the East Coast, on the West Coast, transatlantic. There are wonderful histories, but as far as the biggest of the boats that carried passengers between regular routes, between, you know, Buffalo and Detroit, Detroit and Chicago, Detroit and Duluth. The Great Lakes really set themselves apart from that bunch. That's what I'm I'm talking about. Now, when you look at this map, obviously Chicago was clear hub for a lot of this. And we will we'll talk about a couple of the lines that came in, in contact out of Chicago. Um, Detroit was lucky enough to kind of be on the strait that we call the Detroit River and was between everything. So we were in a great position to not only build the vessels, but sail the vessels and take the people where they needed to go. Lots, these are just representative. There were lots and lots of of various lines that carried folks. I'm talking about the biggest ones here. A little bit of background, and I'll fly through this because you guys probably know this. Robert Fulton didn't invent the steam engine, didn't invent the steamboat. Um, He was very successful. Well, first he was unsuccessful. The vessel he built here for some folks in France, he put the engine in and the thing cracked in the middle. So not everything was was successful, but eventually he came to the United States where he was born and and reestablished that. But there were other people in the United States, the, the early Americas, that were doing this kind of thing. William Henry first had a line of boats with a steam engine in it that ran on a regular schedule on the Conestoga River before the American Revolution. There were also some really revolutionary designs that were coming out. James Rumsey on the Potomac. He had one that had little paddles behind that were pushing the boat. John Fitch had a couple of ideas that worked with not only paddles or oars. One had an internal device that kind of swirled the the, the water through underneath the boat. And my favorite is probably the James Runsey there in the lower left-hand corner, which is basically a hydraulic propulsion system. Today, we'd call that jet skis. So these ideas were all being explored slightly before, slightly after the American Revolution, before Robert Fulton came up with his North River Steamboat replica here. Um, and, And he coupled with the Livingston family and they've got a patent on that and got kind of the, a monopoly on what happened with steam engines in the Northeast. And that kind of delayed the progress of these kind of engines to the Great Lakes a little bit. And there was steam engines in boats on the Ohio River before we had them on the Great Lakes. You know, we were behind, but just slightly behind. The real race came after the War of 1812. Once things opened up, and we always, we always say that the coming of the Erie Canal opened up the floodgates. But if you look at it, the floodgates opened soon after the war was over. 1815 
these people have been beating each other up and fighting each other on the Niagara frontier by 1816. They've gotten together and a Canadian group, a consortium of money came together to build a steamboat and they built a large one, the Frontenac. The curious part is after they sent out quest for quote, they hired Americans to build their boat on the Canadian side. So I argue that it's a great bit of a great example of the fact that people got over the war of 1812 pretty quickly. And this helped start move people in. And this was a Frontenac was a very big boat. And the Canadians are proud of the fact that it was the first to enter the first steamboat to enter the water, 1816. The problem was in 1816, it didn't have an engine. Its engines were being built in England. They hadn't arrived yet. And meanwhile, the Americans over at Sackett's Harbor, which is you know kind of the, the, the American naval base there on Lake Ontario, were busy building another boat, slightly smaller, with Alaire engines coming from New York, so that they were able to get their boat in the water in early 1817 with steam engines running under power about a month and a half before the Canadians got the front and neck powered up and running. There's great stories for both of these vessels. Arguably, the steam was first raised on the Ontario, and both vessels went on to relatively short careers. Their engines, however, went on to really long careers. And I've left out kind of the whole history of the development of engines on the Great Lakes because that's really down in the weeds for most of the folks I talk to. Um, I do touch on the book a little bit and, and you might enjoy that part too. So on the Upper Lakes, that was Lake Ontario. When we get to the Upper Lakes, of course, the walk in the water is the, the big star early on, 1818. And it was, you know, it essentially a sailboat with a, a steam engine in it. And they had pretty much worked out how sturdy the vessel had to be, what kind of engine would make it work. And they got this going. Now, as a steamboat, it ran fine, didn't go very fast. They had a top speed of maybe six knots, seven knots. And really that was probably its downfall. It ran for about three years out of Buffalo over to Erie, uh, sorry, the Niagara River there, Fort Erie. And it, it did just fine running Buffalo to Detroit, made a couple of trips up to Georgian Bay, up to, they got to Niagara, they got over to Green Bay, mostly delivering troops to support some of the forts up there. Uh, but after three years, the walk in the water uh, left Buffalo one time and ran into a, a serious west wind um, and traveling six or seven knots was enough, not enough to, to save it. Um, we've got a real nice model. This was created by uh, Ted McCutcheon, who's a wonderful model builder. This gives kind of the, the most recent information on what the boat probably looked like. Most of the models that we've got in our collection, in fact, that I've seen in other collections, the engine is open in the vessel. Ted McCutcheon found a, a French document that showed that the engine was actually covered, which made a whole lot of sense in an open lake. So this is probably more what the, the walk in the water looked like than many of the illustrations we've seen. The ladies' cabin was in the back. The gentleman occupied the forecastle for the most part. And you can see the, uh, the toiletries that were uh, supplied just forward of paddle wheels there, uh, self-flushing very early on. Walk in the water left Buffalo one night in 1821, drove into a, a west wind. The wind, they had almost made, I think, Cleveland, and they got blown back most of that way and ended up on the beach. It was a soft sand beach. The boat went up and sat down. Most of the people were able to get off. As you can see here, they were uh, taking them off in, in boats and just pulling them. It was pretty close. Everybody survived, so the first shipwreck was not a disaster. The engine was later salvaged, put in the Superior, which is a familiar story. The, the, the engines often lasted longer than the boats. This great painting was done at the behest of Mrs. Palmer. Mrs. Thomas Palmer was riding on the vessel. She was on it for the inaugural trip, and then she was with her husband, and then she was traveling on it on the, the final trip. And in fact, she was one of the women, she and one of the cooks got off the vessel and went and got the, uh, the lighthouse keeper to help save everybody. So she then commissioned this painting, which is in the Detroit Historical Society collection. And there's another painting, which was painted from the deck angle, which is in the Burton Historical Collection at the Detroit, Detroit Public Library. I, I love this quote because it says, this accident may be considered as one of the greatest misfortunes which have ever befallen Michigan depriving them of communication. This is kind of important because for the first time, trip from Buffalo to Detroit taking a couple of weeks, 
a trip from Buffalo to Detroit took a couple of days. And it really changed the way people in Detroit thought. Uh, you know, all of a sudden their news was new. Their, uh, their oysters that were coming in from the east were fresh. It, was, it really changed kind of their worldview and connected them to the east coast. And to have the walk in the water stop running, um, you know, sink and not being able to run for it and not another steamboat for several months, it really did it considered a disaster. And I, and I always like to point out that this is just, again, a couple of years after the city had been taken by the British and burned and many people had died. The, 1805, the city had also burned and luckily not many people died. But, you know, those are pretty much disasters, but the loss of the walk in the water was a huge disaster to the residents of Detroit. Steamboats had become important and they started growing. This is an interesting shot of the, the Michigan in 1833. The Michigan, instead of having one engine and two paddle wheels, had two engines and two paddle wheels. And it was, it was something that was repeated a few times not a lot. It was kind of hard to control, kind of hard to sync up. It wasn't the best way to go, but it did make, especially in the early days, when you lost one engine or a paddle wheel was broken by detritus in the water, you at least had the other paddle wheel and the other engine to get you home, which is important. The, the boats are rigged for sails. And indeed, at this very, very early time, they used sails occasionally. Again, they're not running very fast. If they could use it to speed them up, they did, but it wasn't long afterwards they stopped using sails because that really kind of discouraged people from trusting the steam engine. That was, that was probably the biggest deal. The vessels got larger. The steam engines got more reliable. The, this is a, an interesting steeple type engine. Uh, pretty soon the, the walking beam engine became more, more uh, notable. But here we've also <laughs> noticed we've moved the, the steering <laughs> space, the, the place where the pilot stands, to the front of the boat as opposed to the back, which it was in the walk on the water. <laughs> um, nice picture of Detroit, again, Michigan in the forefront. But now in 1837, we've got a number of steam vessels that are running between uh, Buffalo and Detroit every day. Hundreds, it had about 100 sailboats registered in Detroit and I think about 27 steam vessels registered either in Detroit or Buffalo at this time. Uh, what are people coming for? Well, a lot of them were coming because they were immigrating and were bringing all their stuff with them. But we're also seeing a lot of tourism. The tourism has begun here as, as early as 1806, 7 and they're going to see Niagara Falls, which would get them from the, you know, the train and, and uh, that to the falls, but they also were going to see Mackinac Island at this point. And eventually, they're going to see Chicago. The uh, River and Harbor Convention in 1847 wrote a paper on that, and it, it was a really important thing to open people's eyes, people from the south, people from the, the Western Rivers area, and particularly the financiers from the east, getting them on some of these ships and getting them to Detroit and Mackinac and eventually Chicago for the convention there in 47 was a really important part of opening their eyes to the possibilities that existed on the Great Lakes. The, the vessels continued to get larger, and this is really where we get the first palace steamer era. Again, the pilot houses in the front, the vessels became so long that they, they suffered from what I call the kind of the hot dog thing, where in a, in a big sea, they would not only twist back and forth this way, but they would also twist this way. And the boat, or the ship masters, the ship builders were trying to figure out ways to slow that down. A wooden vessel always works. That's a good thing. But if it works too much, that's not a good thing. So they started putting in the hogging arches we're familiar with. In fact, this next one, we not only have hard hogging arches, but we have struts, wire cable struts that are running up to various points above the deck and then down through the deck in order to do that. They also had early iron straps on the inside of the hull, anything to keep the boat from working as much as it was. But these vessels really, you know, they, they kind of stretched. They were the biggest steam vessels working in the United States at the time. They were extremely elegant. I mean, this is about the 1840s. The, the Palace Steamer era here started in 1835, 1837 extended through 1857, you know, and this is a pretty typical, the, the interiors of these boats were just gorgeous. There was a reason they were called palatial. And while the, the ticket price kind of limited it to uh, away from 
the real poor, there were a lot of people, not only in the upper class who were the tourists, but the middle class who were coming into the uh, into the area, either from New York, the New England, or from Europe at this point, that were able to travel pretty well. Often, immigrants would uh, get a the ladies would get a cabin, and the men would men folk would be down on the uh, the main deck protecting their farm equipment, whatever they were moving at that time. Within about 15 years, the boats got bigger and the insides got incredibly more fancy. Um, you know, beautiful rugs, beautiful furniture, uh, beautiful lacquer uh, coverings uh, and the paint and things, which, of course, made them more susceptible to fire down the road. But as far as places you wanted to go to be seen, Getting on one of these boats and traveling was probably the best way to travel in North America at the time. Railroads are coming on, and we'll discuss that in a minute. The roads were still awful. The stagecoaches and land-based travel was terrible, except that the, even in even the railroads, the railroads were coming up. But imagine a you know a railroad train of this era. It's one long cylinder, and you can walk from one end to the other. On these boats, you could walk around two or three decks. There was plenty of things to do. There were lots of people to see. It was the, the most elegant way you could travel. So then we got to 1857. Massive crash, the Panic of 1857, which really started in Cleveland, but it was a, it was a, a real estate bubble just like the one we saw about 10 years ago. And it really took down many of the businesses that supported this. In fact, the, the repercussions were felt in Europe, but that wasn't the only problem. The railroads were coming in and you can see in 1850, there's no railroad that runs under Lake Erie. There's no way of getting across Southern Ontario to get to Chicago. Uh, by 1860, that has been established and well-established. They were running very fine railroads lines by this time. The Lakeshore and Southern, the Southern Michigan, the Pierre Marquette were all kind of coming into their own. And this is a big competition. There was also competition from propellers. I mean, we've been running side wheelers so far. You can see one there in the middle, but you can also see off to the left there, there's a propeller and propellers were arguably not as fast, but they were far more efficient. They would burn half the amount of wood that a uh, that a side wheeler would burn uh, in in make now if side wheelers were faster and frankly many argued that the side wheelers had a better feel to them there was kind of a a natural motion like almost a clickety clack of a railroad track that made that a more comfortable ride whereas a propeller if the propeller was new and well balanced it was great if the propeller was out of balance there was a real vibration to a, a boat like that pluses and minuses all the way around that was competition and the biggest problem was that a lot of these steamboats were going up in flames. I mean, they were colliding with each other. We didn't have aids to navigation. We didn't have rules of the road yet. A single fire on a, on a vessel that could have been caused by an overheated boiler or varnish rags left in the wrong spot and 175 lives would be lost within minutes. And this made for really bad publicity. And between the panic between the railroads and between the bad publicity, there was uh, the, the crash of, of uh, 57 was really tough, ended the palace steamer era. Boats didn't stop running. They were just much smaller. They were more utilitarian. This is a picture of the arrow on the Detroit River from about that time, our great Robert Hopkin painting. So people were still doing this. They were still traveling, but they weren't traveling in such elegant style. And it took a while for the 57 uh, recession to fade. And by the time that did, we were into the American Civil War. And once the Civil War started, really the, the transportation, much like in World War I or World War II, transportation became aimed at fixing the, you know, being directed to the war effort. This is one of my uh, favorite slides, because when you get into the weeds of the business, there were two really, really successful business models. The one on the left is Chicago-based, and the one on the right is Detroit-based. Albert Goodrich had a, a, a wonderful ride as a manager of steamships, and he was really fairly rough and ready when it comes to this. Eventually absorbed a lot of companies. In Detroit, there was a whole different attitude that started in the 1860s and, and was run basically by John Owen and eventually by the McMillan family. But just two completely different business models, and both of them worked. If we look at Goodrich, basically Lake Michigan and moved into Lake Superior, he was an active captain. He captained his own boats 
and made sure he knew the crews and hired the best people for his vessels. He had 26 vessels over 67 years, good long run. He used steamers, meaning side wheelers and propellers. He built new. He also bought used, again, absorbed a lot of companies. He used a bunch of different shipyards in Detroit, in Manitowoc, in Chicago, and had a really good, solid business running, on, on mostly on Lake Michigan. The DNC line, the Detroit and Cleveland Steam Navigation Company, later navigation company, basically Lake Erie, Buffalo to Detroit, on and off. Detroit to Lake Huron, started and ended that a couple of times. They were, they were financiers. These guys were bankers and politicians, and they made it work for them. They owned the shipyards. They owned the vessels. They owned the, the woods where the wood came from. They owned the manufacturers for the engines. They had only 14 vessels in 82 years. They were all side wheelers, all steamers. They were all new except for one, which we'll mention in a second. He bought it from Goodrich and they built them in their own, their own steam, their own shipyards. Um, it was very, very enclosed. They also had close relationships with their ma major rivals. There was the DNC line, Detroit and Cleveland, but there was also the Cleveland and Buffalo, the C and B. There was also the Buffalo and Detroit, which frankly, they owned almost wholly and they sat on the boards of all these companies. So it was really quite an integrated Lake Erie thing. It, it, it worked wonderfully. There were also other business models. Of course, Jay Gould had his connections between Green Bay, Lake Superior. The anchor uh, line was running by the Pennsylvania Railroad, Northern Steamship. That was Jim, Jim Hill out of Minneapolis. Grand, the Great Northern Railway was his concentration, but he needed vessels. So he had two passenger vessels and six freight vessels. He completely separated the two, which was unusual for the rest of these. Most of them carried both passengers and freight. Uh, Canadian Pacific had a whole fleet from Georgian Bay to Port William, four separate fleets actually, where the Canadian steamship lines, where they separated that whole thing. And, and then there's the Chicago, Duluth and Georgian Bay line. We all call the Georgian Bay line was passenger only, no freight, strictly vacation. So there were some different business models that proved very successful. DNC started with the RN Rice and another vessel. The other vessel burned almost immediately soon after they started. And what they did was they turned to Goodrich. Goodrich had built the Northwest in 67 and he couldn't afford it. He actually overextended. So he used it for the first year when it was brand new, which was great. And then he sold it to the DNC to replace their burned vessel. So this, you know, there was, there was a, a great crossover there. Eventually, all of these companies, Graham and Morton, Detroit and Cleveland, and uh, CNB, Goodrich, they all eventually built larger and larger vessels and really refined their routes. And uh, the routes that they found out of Chicago were really only viable if they could do a turnaround in a day. In other words, Chicago to Michigan City, Chicago to Benton Harbor, Chicago to South Haven. If they had to go farther north, much farther north than Muskegon, it wasn't really a viable route. And it kind of changed both Graham and Morton and Goodrich uh, juggled those uh, similarities um, and made them work. Over time, they made them work. The vessels all got bigger. They all got prettier. They often carried freight, but really their concentration, freight was kind of the paid the, paid the coal bill, but it was the people on board and the, the publicity that they got out of it that really drove it. And it was the publicity, and I could love to do a whole presentation just on the art that came out of this period, starting in the late 1880s into the 1890s through 1900. And my, my first career was as a graphics guy. And they really did a beautiful job of selling the vacation aspects. By this time, most of the folks who had moved in, the immigrants, that first wave, large wave of immigrant that came in after the American Civil War, largely German, largely Irish, first hints of, of Italian, the first hints of Polish, a lot of uh, Nordic countries were coming in. Those people have come in and they've established themselves. They're now making enough money that they might be able to afford a trip from Chicago to Michigan City on a Sunday 
And little by little, we're seeing the business change from a transactional business, businessmen traveling from Milwaukee to Buffalo, businessmen uh, moving their products this way. The railroads have now started to step in and the, the, the companies have changed. They're, they they switched their focus from kind of a general transportation to a very recreational uh, side. And some of this art is just really, really cool. It really talks to the period, the, the clothing, the hats. I mean, this was, we're getting into Great Gatsby era. And then we move beyond that. This is, of course, Georgian Bay Line. Started in Chicago um, and, and ran out of Chicago for a long time with their, their headquarters there. Oddly enough, their headquarters then moved to Indiana for a few years and then was bought and moved to, uh, to Detroit later on. And it ran out of Detroit for the rest of its career. You know, and many, many, now this is the Detroit waterfront, but Cleveland, Buffalo, Chicago, Milwaukee, all, all could boast these kinds of things. Detroit had uh, something that I, I, I'm not sure those other places had. We had the opportunity for resorting up the St. Clair River and down the Detroit River and over to Putin Bay and Lake Erie and over to uh, Cedar Point. This was all happening at this time and Detroit was kind of a, a center for a lot of smaller companies. The Star Line ran out of here, the White Star Line, the Ashley and Dustin. There were a number of just day lines that ran out of Detroit and also Detroit because we had a river. Uh, we had a couple of ferry companies that were running every 15 or 20 minutes back and forth between the United States and Canada. So there was a lot of, a lot of coal smoke on the Detroit Riverfront. You know, while most of the cargo vessels, the ore carriers, the lumber vessels were moving, you know, between ports to the north and ports to the south and going right past us, it was the passenger boats that were really important to Detroit's waterfront. The paddle wheelers started to lose their popularity. And there was a big period starting in 1899 with the Taj Mu and running through 19. 14, 1912, where there were about 36 large passenger steamers built around the lakes. So about two a year were being built, a lot of them in Detroit, a lot of them in other places. But there was, there was really quite, you know, this was really quite an engine for these wonderful boats. And they didn't all look like the DNC paddle wheelers. All of a sudden, we had boats that didn't look like Frank Kirby's. They looked like ocean carriers. Here we've got a picture in Chicago of the North and South American. You know, these are vessels that look very much different than what the DNC looked like. But DNC, Frank Kirby was, you know, an investor in the DNC along with the McMillan family. And DNC stuck with their paddle wheelers the entire run from 1866 until they shut down in 1950. And vessels just kept getting bigger. This is the, the city of Cleveland three. And it, I was able to get the publisher to put this kind of double spread of, of what the vessel looked like and how intricate these boats were. Once they had grown, they were talking six different decks, four passenger decks. They're absolutely gorgeous. The insides of these things, this is where I argue that it's, there was a second palace steamer era that started about 1899 and lasted, well, most of, the, most of it lasted until 1924. By 1950, this boat was out of business. DNC basically shut down, but these are gorgeous, gorgeous vessels. This is the men's smoking lounge on the top deck. Uh, fortunately, we've still got that painting that's, that's there. And the city of Detroit three got bigger, 1912. The insides of these things were gorgeous. If you got to see the, the Kuwait and when it was over in uh, Saugatuck, they were really, really pretty pretty boats and well taken care of. Largest of the gang, Greater Detroit, Greater Buffalo. Chicagoans will remember when it got cut down into uh, aircraft carrier during World War II. And while Detroit and the rest of the country was loving these vessels for a time, they were getting old. There was new technologies coming. And frankly, all of these come out of Detroit. You got Henry Ford and the Model T. And all of a sudden, auto camping becomes he and Firestone and Edison are going camping. And they're doing it in their cars. We also start seeing companies that are carrying things in trucks. This here is a Grabowski power wagon, which lasted in Detroit for a little while. But then the other car companies got into the business. 
trucks started carrying things. And initially it was great for the boats. They'd meet the boats at the wharf. They'd whisk their uh, cargo off to wherever they had to go. But as the roads got better and the trucks got more reliable, all of a sudden trucks started becoming as big a competition as railroads. We also, the camping thing started kicking in. We've got an early camper wagon or an RV. This is a 1935 RV that was produced near Detroit. At depths of the depression, the guy was successful. And then we had in Detroit, we had a company that started creating semi trucks. And when Fruhoff got into the semi trailer business, that really, really started that ball rolling. So that was competition. Of course, we see the a kind of the end of this massive boat building. The CNB and the Greater Buffalo were converted into flat tops for the, the Great Lakes Naval Station there, just north of Chicago. Once the war was over, they were scrapped and they were gone. Most of the vessels that were running in the Detroit area, this is how they ended their life. This is Putin Bay, which ran from Detroit down to Putin Bay over to Cleveland, back to Sandusky. So many of these boats, all of that gorgeous interior was completely lost. We got lucky in Detroit because the city of Detroit 3, which was the first one to be scrapped, frankly, the only one to be scrapped, it took them too long to do it. Much of the interior was bought by a gentleman in Cleveland who was going to kind of recreate it on his farm. I guess he was a paint mogul and he had plenty of money. He was good, except that he died. When he died, oddly enough, the Stouffer's restaurant chain bought all of the interior parts. And this was right about the time that our museum was getting started, 1960. And we bought just the Gothic room of that building. I think we paid about a quarter of what they paid for the Gothic room. They did very well by that sale. It's a great picture of Paul Coletta, who was one of the guys that was working at installing that. It's the only existing version of Great Lakes Steamboat Gothic that we have, and we're really happy to have it on display. If you get to Detroit and you can visit the Dawson, this is, this is what greets you when you walk in. Some of these boats are still running, the Juniata, and had two sisters. The sisters no longer, but the Juniata still running, uh, well, sorry, still floating. You can get over and see her as the Milwaukee Clipper in Muskegon, one of four ship museums that are in that harbor. And I'm going to be talking with these guys later in the summer. It's, it's, it's still in very, very good shape, as opposed to the Aquarama. Also, uh, this is a World War II tanker that was repurposed. Beautiful interior, very Art Deco, evidently spectacular. The story in the book that I tell is, is rather unfortunate. The family still lives in Detroit, the McKee family that ran it. They love it, but it, it was one of those bad luck things that didn't go the way that the Milwaukee Clipper did. We had in Detroit some passenger ferries that were running into the 1990s steam run vessels. These two boats are still afloat. This is the Columbia. The St. Clair is also here. Columbia is actually in Buffalo, hopefully on its way to New York, a part of the new Falls River line. But the St. Clair suffered a serious fire last year, lost most of its superstructure. The owners are dedicated to rebuilding it, but probably will never be something that Detroiters can do again. Of course, there's you can still take a boat. You can get on a cruise line. This is the Victory and the Victory 2 that originally were based out of Ann Arbor, but now that that's been sold, so they're moving on. The Pearl Gang, Pearl Mist, I think, comes through. American steamships have American Cruise Line. Runs boat through the Great Lakes. You can still ride a vessel on the Great Lakes if you really want to. In fact, my wife and I did this one just a couple of years ago. Take a nice four-hour ride on a steam-driven boat. When you get a whiff of that smoke, there is nothing like smelling the coal smoke that comes out of the Badger. And this, again, just got sold last year, and hopefully that is, a, is, a, is good news. But the era that we're talking about, the era of the palace steamers, I point to when the South American left the Detroit dock for the last time. South American had always traveled Detroit to Chicago or Detroit to Duluth, sharing with the North American kind of that route stop at Mackinac for their very last run. They were going in the opposite direction, down the Whalen Canal, off to Montreal. And fortunately, we've got a wonderful collection of things that came off of that boat. People pulling into Montreal, you can see Expo 67. I think I was about 12 years old when I went to see that. It was pretty impressive. But here's a picture of Captain Testian ringing up, finished with engines. That was a very sad moment. They passed the vessel on to a seaman school on the East Coast. Unfortunately, it wouldn't pass Coast Guard regulations and essentially 
The North American had sank on the way to the Harry Lundberg School. The South American made it to Maryland, but I think it ended up in New Jersey and just basically rotted. A team from Detroit went and got a lot of artifacts, a lot of pieces out of the staterooms, a lot of the uh, portholes. In fact, the Great Lakes Maritime Institute is auctioning off a porthole from the South American. If you're interested, Great Lakes Maritime Institute, I think is glimmy, G-L-M-I dot org. So there are parts of it still around, but really that was the end of the palace steamship era on the Great Lakes, at least in Detroit. And we all love talking about that. I love pictures like this. I've talked to people who have ridden on these vessels. They have wonderful memories of it. I never got the opportunity. I was the DJ on one of the Bablo boats for a summer, which was a great, great bunch of fun, but it was nothing like traveling on the city of Detroit 3 or on the city of Cleveland 3 or any of those large vessels. And it was a real honor to be able to capture that in a book. And little by little, I'm collecting all the mistakes I made. And if I get really lucky and you buy lots of those books, I'll get a chance to do a second edition where I can fix the things I got wrong. But luckily, they're very few. And it's really nice to be able to tell people about it. I really appreciate Jim and, and guys inviting me to talk about that. I'm happy to answer questions. Joel, thank you so much. That was outstanding. There have been a number of questions posted in the chat. I'm, instead of me reading them, I'd sure like you all to have the opportunity to un unmute yourself. Uh, Ted Karamansky, especially if you want to kick things off, unmute and ask your questions. Hey, Ted. Hey, Joel, that was just great. There's so many, it's a wonderful book. I mean, it's a priceless book for the field and thanks Thank for you. doing it. I guess the first thing that always interests me is Mississippi boats in the antebellum period were just downright dangerous. I mean, the mortality rates were pretty high. On the other hand, you know, we didn't have any harbors on the lakes and there were some pretty terrific accidents on Lake Erie and Lake Michigan for for passenger steamers do you have any sense as to which was worse or was it just hey this is the antebellum period luck at a draw it's interesting and i didn't realize it until i really dug into it that kind of the apex of the western rivers boats was before the american civil war and they used mostly high pressure steam engines as i understand it you know there's no set rule for that, but the most of the engines on the Great Lakes were low pressure. Either one with a breach causes an <laughs> incredible explosion. Um, so that would have been just a minor difference. But I think the the kind of the development period, you know, we had a lot of steamboat explosions. Uh, they tended to be on the smaller boats, I think. There weren't a lot of them on the large vessels, but lots of fires. You know, you, you get those engines fired up and especially in the, the era of racing, which nobody wants to admit ever happened, but there, you know, there was some serious competitions going on and engines were pushed to their limits. And sometimes those cost, you know, incredible fires. Uh, you, you, most of you folks have, have read about them or seen them. Actually, the divers have been down and seen some of the destruction that was caused by these things. Yeah, thanks so much, Joel. Thanks, Ted. I would certainly invite anyone else to unmute and ask your questions. I know uh, there was a question that you pretty well answered about are any of these boats still existing and uh, are they being used? And you covered that pretty well with the Kuwaitan and the Milwaukee Clipper. It's nice that those things have been saved. I can't imagine the effort that it takes to save something the size of the Milwaukee Clipper. I know the Kuwaitan, uh, you know, Pat Labity was involved in that very early on with the, the couple that bought it. And they did a as good a job as could be done, but the amount of money that's required. Um, I know it moved over to Owen Sound. I'm not sure that Owen Sound is able to afford it. They're talking about moving it to Kingston. I haven't haven't read the latest on that process, but these are incredibly tough things to uh, first save, then afford, and then improve, and then market. And it's nice that the Milwaukee Clipper people are, are really keeping that, that whole process going. Again, they, the, the St. Clair, the Bablo boat, which is not a very large thing compared with the, the Milwaukee Clipper, it's privately owned. They've been pouring millions of dollars into it. I know that the, the principals are, are surgeons, so they, they have some millions of dollars, but not an unlimited amount. You know, the, the dedication it takes to keep something like the Milwaukee Clipper up and running and viable 
is absolutely incredible. Yeah, I had no idea how fortunate I was. I, I grew up just five, six miles from Hammond Marina where the Milwaukee Clipper sat for many years and just always took for granted. It's the big boat down at the harbor. Didn't appreciate just how important that history was that we had right here. Unfortunately, well, and actually keeping something going like the Badger. I mean, it, it, it's taking the money that's behind the, you know, a huge shipping company to make something like, like that viable. You know, now that they've corrected all the environmental issues that they had to do, now it's a matter of selling it, getting people to do it. And I hope there's enough people that when they, they smell that coal smoke, they know they've got to take another ride. Fred Stonehouse, great to have you here. I hope you're having good weather for the UP200 dog sled races these days. <laughs> we're, we're, we're running about zero and uh, we just finished kicking them out. So they've got 100 miles tonight and 100 miles coming back on Saturday. But Very good. That's, again, my, my pardons. Joel, question. Uh, what's your thoughts about the revival we're seeing of Great Lakes cruising and particularly, I think, some of the vessels that will be on the lakes this summer? Uh -huh. That's what we want to know. I think it's great. It was really on, it, on an upswing, and there were a couple of things that were going on. Now, I'm, again, I'm coming from a Detroit perspective, and Detroit's got a, a problem because the Jones Act kind of got in our way. Uh, those of you familiar with the Jones Act was meant to promote the American maritime by saying that a, a vessel coming from Britain to the United States couldn't uh, go from uh, New York down to, say, Boston without going to a foreign country again. So going up to Nova Scotia and then back, it was, it was meant to make sure that American flag vessels were carrying American coastal trade. But in the Great Lakes, that was kind of an issue because if you have a, a cruise ship that everybody wants to go to First Toronto, which is great. And then you want to go to Niagara Falls. So you're stopping in Buffalo, which is great. And the next logical stop two days down the road is Mackinac, which is U.S. again. So that we were watching cruise ships come by fairly regularly, but they were stopping in Windsor across the river because that fulfilled the Jones Act issue. Many of those companies have received waivers. And just before COVID hit, Detroit Port Authority, which has built a new facility, 10 years ago to accommodate such a thing was went from about five stops per year to about 35 stops a year and was was on track to you know double that again covid shut many things down we're hoping that comes back from a standpoint of getting people out there we heard a great presentation up in superior a few years ago at the AGLMH conference from a man who was involved in the cruise ship business and people find, much as they, when they go to Europe and take a cruise, they find the Great Lakes cruises are much more expensive than, say, a Disney cruise in the Caribbean. Much of that has to do with the opportunities to, to present gambling, which you can't do based on treaty rules between the United States and Canada. So Great Lakes cruises are still pretty expensive, but I I was just flipping through Smithsonian Magazine this morning, and the cruise ship advertisements suggest that they're doing very well with those cruises, and it's nice to see them back. It's nice to see people from around the world coming to take those cruises and see what the Great Lakes has to offer. Well, I think it's terrific. I occasionally do some work on board, and uh, it's, it's really been a, an interesting journey over the last 20 years to see going from maybe 1,000 people, quite literally, cruising the entire lakes, 1,000 people. If you can imagine that in about 1913 or 2013, up to who knows this summer, if they all can fill. I mean, you still got to sell the berth. Sure. But, uh, certainly the, the boats will be here. And the ones I'm looking at are just incredible. Well, and I'm glad they're hiring local knowledge to tell everybody about it. Uh, I mean, they are just beautiful ships, it's expedition ships, some of them. But unbelievable. But we'll see what happens. Let's hope. Let's hope. COVID three, COVID three, shut them down again. <laughs> nah. I'll just take you. an I'll take an opportunity to tell everybody real quick that Fred Stonehouse is scheduled to be our December third Friday speaker this year, uh, speaking on the history of the U.S. Life Saving Service on the Great Lakes. Definitely one of the leaders in that field, and we're really looking forward to that. You're very kind. Thank you. But I'll thank you too, Joel, for a great presentation. I I didn't catch all of it, but it was terrific. Thanks, Fred. Nice Make sure. Nicholas, uh, yes, uh, um, something that I've been having a hard time trying to pin down is how many of the big steamers on the lakes were twin screw. I, I know it's a very small amount, excluding the uh, car ferries, but 
I still have had a hard time trying to get even just a good, just quick count on, at least for the U S side. That you're, that's not something I can answer, you know, with, I, I, with, with the steamers, I, so much of it was that. And when they got into the, the propellers, I, I would guess that a fair number of them were twin screwed. And of course, with the, the rail steamers that you got into three screws, but I, that's not a question I can answer. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, thank you anyway, sir. Sure. Great presentation. Thanks. I, I was just ask, going to ask a, a quick question. I know you a great talk so far, but um, uh, you mentioned, I'm familiar with the walking beam engine, but you mentioned an, an earlier one. I called it a steeple. And I'm not sure if I understand how that one works. Uh, there were a couple of other engine types that were used on the Great Lakes early on. And instead of transferring the power through the walking beam, which would have allowed for the, the rotation of the cam, the steeple was very, very, I mean, it was, it was probably over-engineered, but worked on the principle of a piston driving um, a, a rod up and down and off the side of those rods were the other rods that drove the cams. So it was, there's, boy, there's some wonderful pictures available on the internet. Maritime History of the Great Lakes is a wonderful website. I think it's uh, maritimehistoryofthegreatlakes.ca run by Walter Lewis. And there's, there's some wonderful images of some of those early engines available. And if you look at a lot of the pictures, as you go through some of the art, you will notice that early on, so 1820 to 1845, there are a number of varieties of engines that are being used. And some of them survived quite a bit. Like I said, the engines were at least the half the cost of the boat. And even if the boat rotted or, or sank, they would take the engines out and make sure that they got reused. So some of those engines survived quite a while. Did they take up as much room as the walking beam did or... Uh, they did. Essentially, yeah. they might have taken up a little less, and it really wasn't until they got into the horizontal engines that the engines were less intrusive in the uh, in the salon area. Really, through the through the 1910s, you know, those engines were a big part of the middle of the boat. Those steeple engines were really tall. They had the pistons stacked on top of each other, and the Henry Ford Museum has a great example of one on exhibit. If you want to study steam engines, that's a great place to go and look, and you see that. Oh. Uh, or in the Chicago area, go dive on the Desmond, and it's got a steeple compound engine. Hmm. Uh, I can't think of any others that are diveable, but there's probably some. Greg Borzo, please. Uh, I'd add uh, to, to what everyone else said. Very interesting presentation, and my wife and I are now going to go look for some good cruises in the Great Lakes for sure. Oh, great. But my question is, you didn't mention the Eastland. Was that catastrophe just a complete anomaly or did anything approaching it ever happen on the Great Lakes in, in the pleasure cruising arena? I'm sure there were boats that were built that were more tender than others. No question about it. But everything I've read about the Eastland, it was a disaster. That was built at Jenks, wasn't it, in Port Huron? Seems to me. And when it came off, it was, I think its first runs, it, it, it spent some time on Lake Erie before it went to Lake Michigan. And there were, people were scared of it before it got there. They tried to do some reparations to the, the tenderness of the boat by transferable ballast. I think they added a lot of concrete. That was one of the issues. I think the other thing had to do with the Siemens Act of 1915 following the Titanic disaster when they insisted that more lifeboats, and when I say insisted, that was a good idea. <laughs> I'm not against that. Yeah. Um, when they added the lifeboats to the an already tender vessel, I think that probably signaled its fate. It was a tough boat. It got passed from company to company. Eventually, it was run by somebody that just leased it out. They didn't even run it as a regular vessel. They leased it to other lines. And so it was kind of an extra boat. And I think people understood that. And when things went bad in 1915, that was, the, you know, it, did it, anything not everybody's else, attention. Did it any, was. Did anything else happen in the Great Lakes on that magnitude? You know, 800 deaths, a, a complete a tragedy, anything no. like that otherwise? No, nothing other than fires. I mean, there was a lot of, there were open water fires where people 
and especially people, immigrants that were coming in that could not swim. And even if they could swim, they had hoop skirts on, you know, that, that makes it hard to swim. Those kind of disasters were incredible, but I don't know of anything more than 170, 200 deaths and the 800 that the Eastland, 800 plus that the Eastland suffered. There's nothing, there's nothing to compare with that. It did, and just to speak about the business, it did create problems for other steamship companies to try to convince people to ride the steamboats. And various companies would go out and do demonstrations of how agile their boats were and how they could turn. And they'd, they'd load up the upper deck with a, several hundred people and then take sharp turns just where in close where people could see that to convince people that the boats were safe. The Eastland had deep repercussions for many years. A big dip in ridership. There was a slight dip in ridership. Arguably, World War I had something to do with that. World War II was really good to the steamships lines. World War I was not. Joel, excuse me, you might want to mention the Lady Elgin, the other big disaster, not quite as big as Eastland. No, that's true. And in fact, you've got a very personal history with that one. <laughs> and the Lady Elgin, and that was probably the biggest, uh, the best example of the problems with the Palace steamers. Palace steamers, as I mentioned, had problems with hogging and twisting, and that's because they built them so very light. Back then, the idea to build a sleek vessel was to put a fairly big engine in it and shape it like an arrow. Very narrow, very thin, very, very lightly built. And the Lady Elgin was hit by a two-masted schooner. The Augusta ran into this vessel and it was a bad storm. The Augusta may have been badly handled, but it planted its nose right into the side of the Lady Elgin ahead of the paddle wheels and damn near came as far as the keel. I mean, that's how lightly built the Lady Elgin was. And, it, you know, the fact that it didn't break in half and sink to the bottom immediately is surprising. It was around long enough to allow a lot of people to step into the water to die. Um, I, Valerie, I don't remember the latest count on the, the full number of people that died. Yeah, about, th about 300 died and about 100 survived. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there were, there were a lot of theirs, the Northern Indiana, there were, there were a lot of, uh, of fires that were a problem. Lady Elgin was a problem as far as a collision. Collision was not unusual. Most of the time, the steamers, steamers could survive. DNC had a wonderful record. They had a few collisions. Their biggest problem was with the city of Cleveland three pit in the 18 or the 1940s, I believe. And, uh, but, but only five people died in that collision. So there were some major, major disasters. The Lady Elgin was uh, certainly one of them, but nothing like the Eastland. Us maybe splitting hairs a little bit. And by the way, great presentation. Thank you, Joel. But St. Lawrence Seaway, Empress of Ireland, largest disaster, loss of life, I think, at the time in the Great Lakes region. Uh, you know what? I'm not an expert on it. I don't, I don't have that. Inf I don't know. Well, and they had a, I mean, there were, there were some real ugly things. Uh, the Neuronic that burned in Toronto. The Neuronic was a, a fairly modern vessel that caught fire on the inside, didn't have adequate water pressure for its firefighting. And, and I, I don't remember the number of people that died. I think it was, I think it was under 200. But it, even as firefighters were there pouring water into the boat, because the boat was built to be watertight, the water that the firefighters were pouring in was doing nothing. And it was, there was a fair loss of life. And that was, that was pretty late in the game. That was, uh, you know, long, long after the Lady Elgin. There is to the, the antebellum twin paddle wheeler Niagara, which sank off of the shores of Port Washington, Wisconsin in the 1850s. And that went down with, I believe, over 150 souls. Fire. You know, no, the people that didn't burn up in the fire, they jumped into the water, of course, to get away from the, the heat and the smoke, and they couldn't swim. A lot of them, they're Scandinavian immigrants, I believe, on that vessel. Yep. So, yeah, pretty common. Well, and the, the rumors of the money that was in the pockets that went to the bottom of the lake, of course, is one of those things that keeps people reading those books. We got a question in the chat from Daniel. Did any of the steamers have the ability to take rail cars into their hold so to be able to interface with railroad logistics? Uh, none of the palace steamers did, no. That was kind of a very specialized thing that was developed both on Lake Erie and on Lake Michigan, which was, a, oh, that's a whole nother story. I think uh, George Hilton did a, a great job on uh, 
geez, that book's probably 70 years old now, but um, George Hilton wrote about the, the rail ferries and that was a whole separate thing. The people were completely secondary. The rail cars were primary. I didn't, other than mentioning them in my book, I didn't include those. Great, well, thanks very much. Sure. Uh, see, Bob Jake is with us tonight. He writes in the chat, uh, very good presentation. The Sebastopol sidewheel steamer had a very short service career wrecking just south of Milwaukee in September of 1855 with seven lost. That's a well-known site. It's very shallow and nice to dive. Well, and you know, I, I to mention that there were talking about the big boats, the real palace steamers. There were hundreds of smaller vessels that really concentrated either in a packet, you know, neighborhood, a regu regular uh, trip, or as as primarily as freight carriers that also carried passengers on board. And they might only carry 50 or 70, and they were probably very comfortable. And, and based on reports, you know, the food was great and they, they had a good time, but those were not to me passenger carriers. It was a, primarily freight boats or, or mixed, a um, little bit of both. And while the DNC boats did depend on, and Goodrich too, did depend on carrying brake bolt freight up and down the coasts, they really, when they advertised, they were advertising to travelers. So that's kind of how I broke that down. Very good. I was glad to see Kurt Van Dam on mute. Uh, for those of you who don't know Kurt, he's one of the best known ship model builders, a, a true leader in ship model building community throughout the United States. Glad to have you here tonight, Kurt. Thank you, and good, good to be here. A great presentation. Thank uh, you. I just wanted to mention, though, that the Badger that Joel showed earlier was built as a railroad uh, a ferry. Really? Yeah. And... Uh, and there were a series of them. The Badger is the only one running yet, and it, hmm. it it's uh, it's been a regular, uh, you know, after Memorial Day. Sure. <laughs> well, and the, the Ann Arbor Railroad had a series of boats, and of course, the Badgers got its its partner, the Spartan, which I think they're keeping, and it, it was part of the purchase. And I think it's it's clearly a parts car, um, as I understand it. They're they're sister ships, and the Badger runs, and the Spartan supports. I think there's more than one stuck over there as a parts boat. Are there? <laughs> well, there's a yeah, city of 300, 300 some foot long parts boats. <laughs> Very good. Ted, you got another question for us? Well, you know, this is just a weird thing. But Joel, when, back in maybe like the 80s, I was flying into Philadelphia. And, you know, you when you fly into Philadelphia from Chicago, you come in over the Delaware River and the Navy Yard, and not close to the close to the Navy Yard, but not in the Navy Yard. I remember looking down. It's like, wait, that looks like the South America sitting there, or it could have been the North America. But it was like it was like exactly like that type of ship, and it was sitting there abandoned, you know, in the Delaware River. Uh, was this just me dreaming it or was it a fantasy or do you know? I, I would never suggest you were dreaming, Ted. I don't think that was it. I know the north is on the bottom someplace around Nova Scotia, Cape Breton, and the south, I believe, ended its time in Jersey, either northern Maryland or Jersey. So Philadelphia, probably not, but there were a lot of boats like that. And some of the companies, and I, I didn't get into this, you know, we say that the, the depression really killed a, the Great Depression in 18, 1929, really killed the boats, but it didn't. Most of the large companies, the companies that were running passenger boats were out of business by 1929, or I'm sorry, by 1924, 1925. Goodrich had bought out Graham and Morton. Um, a lot of the other ones were gone. Some boats, companies that had run eight boats were running one or two boats. So by the mid 1920s, arguably labor legislation, port entry legislation, and arguably the automobile had really put an end to that, that business. And only a few survived. Now the Chesapeake Bay line, the old Bay line, they survived into the 1960s. And some of the companies running out of New York survived into the 1960s. But I, what you may have seen in the 1980s was one of those vessels that, frankly, Frank Kirby 
who was with Detroit Dry Dock for years, Frank Kirby designed some of those vessels. So it wouldn't have been surprising if some of them looked like the South American, North American. Thank you. Uh, Ramya, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question, we'd love to have you participate in the conversation. Hi, I'm a grad student at MSU where I study um, Great Lakes shipping, really, and the, and the Lower Detroit River. And so I was really interested in if you could talk a little about the relationship between the Army Corps of Engineers, the lake carriers, and passenger ships, especially in relation to how it worked out when the Livingston Chan was being constructed. Ah. Just to echo, thank you so much for a great presentation. Oh, well, thank you. Boy, no, I would merely be speculating on that relationship. I know that Livingston was, uh, you know, a Detroit banker um, and also involved in the shipping business. He ran the Lake Carriers Association for a long time. And he was the guy that really wanted to get rid of that hump at what was called Lime Kiln Crossing, which was a uh, a severely rocky bottom and you couldn't you couldn't get a boat down I think below 18 feet so he got you know the Army Corps of Engineers to come in and they, you know they coffer dammed off about a mile and a half stretch of the Detroit River and dug it out and made that a, a clean passage for downbound vessels and then the upbound vessels used kind of the Canadian channel to get through it did affect the uh, passenger boats in that they now had a very clean way of going south and then a clean way of coming north. Many of the, you know, the collisions or near, near misses took place in that area before the Livingston Channel went in. But most of the passenger boats were shallow enough that they didn't have a problem with Lime Kiln Crossing. It was more a, an issue with the, uh, the, the cargo vessels. And of course, the Army Corps of Engineers has a long and storied history throughout the Great Lakes, as did the Lake Survey Office, which was also based in Detroit for a long time and the life-saving service and the government. There's great presentation to, and to be done about the government organizations that worked around the Great Lakes so much. If you, frankly, if you've got more specific questions, you're welcome to send them to me by email and we can probably, can, I can try to, if I can't answer them, I can direct you in the right direction. Thank you so much. I will write to you. Thank you. Get a hold of Jim. He'll give you my email address. Ramya, thanks for coming tonight. We're glad that you're here. and. Hope you come back and join us again. Uh, same for everyone. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, we're getting pretty well past eight here, so we should be wrapping up pretty soon. But if there's any more questions, we'll get those in. Uh, a lot of great comments in the chat, uh, Joel. Uh, sorry I didn't read them all to you, but many people congratulated you on the excellent presentation. We all really liked it. And well, you know, thank you all for your patience. I haven't haven't given this presentation in a little while, you know. COVID does that, but it's great to see so many faces, so many people I know or people I'd like to know. Well, when Joel agreed to do this presentation, it came with a condition that he would only speak tonight if we agreed to have him back in person when we can. So we are going to take him up on that. We look forward to having you in person in Chicago as soon as we can make that happen. Perfect. Uh, Thanks, also, Jim. Coming up uh, in April, we've got Russ Green is going to be presenting on the new NOAA Marine Sanctuary in Lake Michigan. And uh, we'll have a lot of other good talks scheduled. Any last comments from anyone else? When do we open the door? Um, you can certainly visit the museum now as far as when we're gonna start having larger gatherings there, uh, hopefully pretty soon. We don't have that worked out just yet, but uh, we are glad to have the museum back open on a daily basis. So uh, you can certainly visit and come see the new exhibits anytime. Will do. All right, Joel, thank you so thank much. Thank you, everybody. Um, looking at another comment, uh, the Murdochs, uh, Lee and Joanne Murdoch, uh, right there. Thanks. For Hi, guys. Presentation. Um, so thank you. This was an outstanding presentation. Uh, really glad to have yeah. you. Fantastic. I want to recommend the book. <laughs> if you like the presentation, go out and buy the book. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. That'll make the guys at University of Michigan Press very happy. Thank you. <laughs> so uh i think that's going to wrap it up for us tonight thanks Going all the comments had a blast thank you it was a great presentation thank you all for coming Look forward to seeing everybody in person as soon as we can all right <laughs> good night cheers, cheers. Good night. Bye. Bye. have a good night